So I'm sorry to interrupt all the great conversations, but that's why we have the entire afternoon at your disposal. So we'd like to kick off now um, with the chair, uh, the discussion on macroeconomic and monetary challenges, which is chaired by Peter. We will have a discussion concluded with a Q&A session, and specifically on this one, we'll be asking you to vote via iPad. And I know that Peter is really relying on your views and on you to vote, so if you have not got an iPad, make sure to tell us, we'll get you one, and go to the polling section whenever we have the questions coming up. And with that, I hand over to you, Peter. Thank you, thank you. Okay. So, I have about eight questions here. Uh, I will ask only three, depending on how the debate goes. So I count on you to, to click on your iPad, and, uh, and the, the results will, will, will come immediately on the screen, very quickly. So, so let's, let's try this, this technology. The, the purpose of the, the, the panel is uh, macro and monetary challenges. You remember Mario, Mario was uh, stressing the need to have shared, shared diagnosis on the root causes of the problems we have. So we'll see a little bit in the presentations here if we, we can agree on diagnosis. And the other point, of course, is also what do you do about this? What sort of collective action do you need? What sort of institutional changes would you like to see? So which we will refer to the discussions of this morning, of course, thinking about that. So I thought the best would be to start with Maury. Uh, we'll have a sort of 10 minutes presentation, followed by Anne and Yan Li, just after. So you have 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. Then they have a chance to react relatively briefly because we want this session to be extremely interactive. So, and, and brief intervention, quick interventions. So, uh, Maury, you, you start. And you have, a, you have a slide, a few slides to present. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. Uh, and thanks for the invitation to this wonderful conference. Uh, let me start out by issuing my disclaimer. Uh, these are my views alone and not those of the IMF's management uh, executive board or other members of its, of its staff. Um, I want to start out with the uh, picture that um, Pierre Olivier put up. Uh, this was not a coordinated policy, but just uh, happened, uh, including uh, 2016 projections on global imbalances. Uh, looking at this history, it's very obvious that we see a buildup leading up to the crisis, a sharp contraction. And now in the, the very recent years, we see, uh, again, an expansion of these imbalances. Um, there is uh, some change in position with uh, oil exporters uh, on net becoming importers. Uh, there are also expanding uh, what might, we might think of as excess imbalances as we measure it at the fund. Uh, certainly um, China, Japan, uh, some countries in the Eurozone, Germany and the Netherlands moving into a uh, large surplus. The U.S. moving into a uh, large deficit um, larger than what our, our models would indicate are, are warranted. And one question one could ask, and I want to use this question to lead into a broader discussion of monetary issues, is uh, what will be the exchange rate adjustment that this um, uh, development uh, leads to? Now, one of the uh, difficult facts for international macroeconomists is if you just look at the raw data on current accounts and exchange rates, it's very hard to tease out anything looking like what we think the textbooks imply. Uh, I show you a number of countries here, and probably the best case you, you can make is for China. But of course, China has not had a uh, floating exchange rate, and it's not subject to the same asset market shocks as these other, other countries. Um, the problem has been put in the press, in a number of FT articles, in fact, in the, in the fall, as current accounts and exchange rates are not linked anymore. And I think that's the wrong conclusion to draw from these sorts of pictures. Um, you know, at the fund, we believe that um, they are, that the demand curve for a country's product still slopes downward. But there are many, many other shocks. And uh, that worked. Uh, I won't go into detail on this, but um, you know, if you look at the slides later, you'll see some examples. One of the problems is that you know, we live in a world of very complex asset markets with gross flows in uh, 
either direction, out of countries, in countries. And shifts in portfolio demands will have exchange rate effects, which may have no proximate or even medium term obvious relationship to the current account. Uh, asset flows are increasingly important. This doesn't mean that there isn't a sensible adjustment mechanism underway, but of course, asset flows can long impede current account adjustment. If we look at the US experience uh, in the 2000s, the US moved to historically large current account deficits. There was a debate over whether those were sustainable or not. And uh, partly that debate missed the fact that these deficits were the result of financial market developments which should have been quite worrisome in themselves. Uh, probably the deficit was sustainable, but not the underlying factors. Um, one thing we can say for exchange rates, and I do want to make this point rather strongly, is that um, despite the importance of portfolio shifts in determining them, um, there are some regularities. Uh, what I try to illustrate in this chart is the fact that exchange rates actually result uh, adjust in the way you would think to output surprises, with countries having uh, negative output surprises also suffering depreciations. Uh, the left-hand side of this chart shows um, world economic outlook, output growth forecast revisions between the April and October editions uh, annually since 2011, together with the exchange rate response for, on the left, uh, floating rate countries and on the right, more or less fixed rate countries. And um, exchange rates really do seem to perform this buffering function to which President Draghi uh, adjusted, uh, 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 referred this morning. Um, in fact, if we look at the UK now, um, certainly part of what is going on is a result of the exchange rates adjustment to growth expectations. Many other things are going on as well, but um, if we imagine what the UK would look like this week, we're attempting to defend a fixed exchange rate, we can see the value of, uh, of floating rates. Um, let me come back to this issue of gross flows, because I think it's become a very important one, not just for thinking about global financial stability, but thinking about monetary policy. Um, the net current account uh, disguises uh, massive two-way flows. Um, this was also a theme uh, very much present in the paper by Pierre-Olivier and Hélène this morning. And these data are well known to you. Um, another way of looking at this is to consult the stock data, such as the Lane and Milesi ferretti data, uh, and uh, we see well-known patterns. Uh, for advanced economies, particularly an explosion in gross external assets and liabilities relative to GDP, um, increases, albeit less dramatic, for the, emerging, for the emerging markets. And it's here that um, we really worry about the uh, financial stability risks. It is here in these gross positions that the financial stability risks uh, reside, not so much in the net level of the current account. Um, when uh, 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 we, we look at the UK today and observe that it has a very large current account deficit, I think one could, one could much better worry about the, uh, the absolute magnitudes on the asset and the liability side of its very, very large balance sheet. Uh, what does this have to do with monetary policy? Well, if we look at current monetary policy debates, there's a similar uh, dichotomy between what we learn from gross and net asset flows, although it's not usually posed in this way. Uh, you saw basically this diagram uh, earlier. Uh, I think Pierre Olivier showed nominal long-term interest rates. These are the real long-term interest rates. But they illustrate the fact that over the recent years, in fact, the years since the Volcker disinflation in the US, these rates have been falling uh, precipitously. Uh, now they're at historic lows, and data show and analysis suggests that uh, the natural real rate uh, may be at a very low level persistently, which is a factor behind the monetary policy stances being followed in uh, a number of countries. Potential explanations, we've talked about some today. I can add a few. The global saving glut, 
monetary policies themselves. Uh, uncertainty. The world is much more uncertain than before the global financial crisis in multiple dimensions. Safe assets shortage, demographics, low expectations of technological progress, and one could, one could go on. Um, so this is one story about monetary policy. But there's another story out there, which is that monetary policy is driven by liquidity surges, uh, particularly dollar liquidity. And uh, it's buttressed by the notion that a lot of lending in the world is dollar lending, even outside of, of the US. Um, the next slide is one illustration of this, but one can illustrate this uh, uh, in other ways. Um, some work out of the BIS, I think, puts it in a, in a very stark way. It says, don't worry about uh, the Wixellian natural weight, but worry about financing conditions. Um, and I wonder, what do, what do we mean by financing conditions if not the gross flows of assets that support economic activity? Um, the policy conclusions that follow from the, the second view, the, uh, the financing view of economic activity, uh, are unclear. Uh, from the BIS point of view, for example, it means um, don't do so much on the monetary side. Um, uh, you may be feeding bubbles. You may be feeding misallocation of resources. Um, when I put these two views side by side, I feel that they're, they're not really contradictory, but um, complementary. And at some level, the work that Tobin did years ago uh, uh, in building portfolio balance onto macro models was uh, key to understanding how these pieces fit together. I don't think as macroeconomists we've really come up with a, a modern reconciliation a la Tobin, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a uh, uh, a task worth taking. And, um, you know, just thinking about some very simple experiments, I think, reveals the um, uh, possibilities here. So, um, you know, what Tobin set out to do was to reconcile stocks and flows, you know, stock equilibrium and asset markets, uh, flow equilibrium, uh, in a framework where asset stocks always equal asset demands. And in the kind of models he looked at, um, Stock equilibrium would influence the flow equilibrium, the flow that determined how wealth capital uh, evolved over time. Uh, but also factors that affected the flow equilibrium would influence the stock equilibrium. There would be two-way feedback. And one way to think about this is to uh, look at a very simple example. Uh, so suppose globally we have an increase in the demand for safe assets. Now, this could be uh, due to higher uncertainty, higher risk aversion, you know, you, you name it. But in a Tobin type of model, what would this do? Well, Tobin's Q would fall. Uh, the risk-free rate of interest would fall. Um, investment would fall. Capital would fall over time. Uh, this would, by the way, affect economic growth adversely. Um, the marginal product of capital would rise. And the risk-free rate would partially recover, but not completely. And this is a world that, um, maybe not in every detail, but in broad outline, doesn't look that different from, from where we are, in the sense that the risk-free rate is at historic lows. Uh, however, if you look at um, measures of the return to capital, uh, for example, what Bob Hall likes to talk about as the uh, capital wedge, um, which is the uh, you know, the earnings on capital, less the risk-free rate, these are high, they've risen. And people say, why is it that with that wedge so high, people aren't investing? Well, it's because there's been a portfolio shift away from capital, a riskier world, greater demand for, for, for risk-free assets. So I think this kind of approach is one that um, has, uh, has a lot going for it. Now, I'm actually out of time here, and uh, so I'm not going to go through the last slide. But I think this, uh, this sort of world does indicate a policy agenda, one that does address aggregate demand, but also financial stability concerns. Um, in particular, coming from the IMF, it's natural to uh, uh, worry a lot about the global financial safety net, capital flows, things like that. 
I guess um, uh, Anne may be talking more about that, but I will just leave you with, with one thought about the global financial safety net. Um, it's very much related to the risk sharing uh, considerations that Hélène and Pierre-Olivier were talking about. Uh, and to build it, to make it more comprehensive, actually requires more fiscal risk sharing, not just as is being discussed in Europe, but at the global level. And if we're going to talk about the GFSN, then we really have to talk about those issues seriously. And I'll stop there. I'm tempted to, to ask uh, you the question, to ask you the first question on poll. So prepare your iPad for the question will be there. And so it gives you time and to go to, to the podium. And so we take uh, question five in, five in my list. If you cannot, uh, you're illiterate. No, no, you have it normally. Yeah. So you have to look at poll, polling. And that's the, qu the question is, is there. Yeah. <laughs> you okay? Normally it takes you 10 seconds to answer. If you can enter. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, pleasure, of course, to be here, and I want to thank the organizers for the invitation. Uh, enjoyed both papers, but I thought I would direct my remarks much more to Barry's than to uh, Pierre Olivier's, in part because uh, it's closer to what I've been thinking about, and in part because I think there may be something to be added. Uh, first off, it seems to me that the International Monetary Order, which is the title of his paper, needs two things. One, it needs individual countries to have some kind of in monetary sanity themselves, and two, then there need to be uh, some kind of international arrangements that make that all fit together. Uh, so far, at least, I think we don't have the second, but we've had something, at least of the first. Uh, in order to get the second, you need to have, I, I think of the analogy, I suppose, between a bunch of people on a cruise and a bunch of people in a psychiatric ward. On the first, I would expect there to be reasonable order. In the second, I would not. If they're all in the psychiatric ward, it's for a reason. They're all insane. And of course, you're not going to get any coherence between them anyway. And to some extent, uh, the, the international uh, system has characteristics of that in both dimensions. Uh, in the many countries, I'm going back in history a bit, but until, let's say, about 1980, and you can choose your date, I think the true state of the world was one in which Europe, the United States, Japan, and a few other countries, Australia, New Zealand, and so on, were more or less the same um, passengers on a ship. And they provided more or less stability to the rest of the world with the IMF coming in, and I'll come back to that in a second. Starting sometime later on, maybe about the 1990s, we've had some of the people uh, coming in to the ship, and so it's become much more a world economy with fewer insane uh, passengers or insane passengers left on the ship and more an orderly uh, procession. But with that, there's been some learning, and I think that's important too. I think it's our, well, first off, until the 1990s, most capital flows were official. There was very little private capital flow. And many of the things we're discussing now are things that have arisen in large part, not entirely. The Griffin Dilemma was there and all that. But uh, from the 1990s on, the role of private capital has been more important. And that has had major consequences. Now I turn then to the point of the discussion, which, of course, is the role of the International Monetary Fund. 
I think the IMF was pretty, was and is pretty good at handling individual countries when they're moderately insane, moderately or more insane, in the sense that they can diagnose fairly well that you're going to go insane. But on the other hand, until insanity actually happens with consequences, uh, there's not a lot they can do. Uh, they could diagnose it. They could put the diagnosis forward. Uh, but nothing happens until, indeed, uh, the inmates start fighting each other or something uh, similar with that analogy. Uh, obviously, the IMS tech core competence, it seems to me, lies in diagnosing the macroeconomic conditions and other things and being able to perform some kind of reasonable judgments as to what's necessary to, at least to some degree, restore sanity. But it has some degree of power to do that only in cases in which, uh, in addition to having some degree of um, sanity, there is some kind of power behind it, i.e., the need for money, which happens when you've been insane long enough and spending beyond your means and otherwise doing that. Uh, until the 1990s, the IMF handled the crises individually. Uh, even in the 1990s, of course, the mantra was that there had been no developed country that had had a crisis since the 1970s or I guess early 1980s, something like that. It was all a problem of emerging markets, developing countries, and so on. Uh, and one of the problems, the main problem, in fact, was getting the individual country uh, to take more ownership of the needed reforms. The IMF was saying you've got to cut expenditures, et cetera, et cetera, which over the longer term was necessary. And I come back to this because given that that's when the IMF came in, there was a stigma to IMF progress because nobody likes to cut back. Uh, the stigma came from that and not from other things. So how you get rid of that stigma, I have no idea because indeed countries have had IMF programs only when there's been trouble. Uh, getting around that is an issue. Uh, sovereign debt was there, but basically the Paris Club was handling official sovereign debt. And again, it did not become an issue until the 1990s. And of course, at first, even as private debt accumulated, it accumulated mostly in the most creditworthy countries for the most part. And secondly, it took a while to build up to the point where there were international problems with it. So it has become more of a problem for the individual countries since. We now, of course, have sovereign debt uh, in other countries, and not only from the public sector, but the corporate exposure, as was discussed internationally. And the IMF is not well equipped to handle that at the present time, except in the sense that for individual countries, because the IMF's core competence lies with the macro and with the ability to sort of say, hey, if you raise this tax, here's a rough approximation as to what will happen. For the most part, the private markets were more or less willing, private creditors, were more or less willing to accept the IMF forecast as a basis on which restructuring, rescheduling could occur. But only in that sense could it do it. But that was an important sense. And that, to some extent, uh, has become less important for a variety of reasons. Uh, so with that, uh, we have the sovereign debt issue, I think, as a major outstanding issue in handling individual country crises for relatively small countries. Greece. And this public sector debt is, I think, a good case in point of what the problems are. I think most people, observers would agree uh, that debt was and is unsustainable. Uh, the private debt has been reasonably wiped out, and that leaves mostly Greek public debt. And it will be very interesting to see how that is handled. But it should also, I think, be something of an object lesson going forward. Uh, there's another interesting case, which is not international per se, but which will show some interesting things. And that is the case of Puerto Rico which is a commonwealth of the United States, but not a state. And at the moment, there is no bankruptcy law whatsoever applicable to Puerto Rican debt. Uh, the, July 1st, actually, is the first big payment. Brexit may take its mind off it for the time, uh, everybody's mind off it for the time being. But as that wends its way through whatever the processes are, uh, unless there's something passed by the US Congress this week, we will see what happens in the absence of a mechanism there uh, to handle another unsus very unsustainable situation. OK, going to the global part, uh, I agree we need to have a common understanding of the problem. And I agree we could have a better one, without any doubt. But having an understanding of the problem, as Keynes understood, and as I think the IMF has understood for some years, uh, is not the end of the problem, because we had, I think, a common understanding or something close enough to it to matter 
during the, uh, 19, the, the first decade of the century, when indeed global imbalances were widely recognized and where China was largely on the surplus side and the United States was largely on the deficit side. And to its credit, the IMF naively went ahead before the G20 and just sort of said, okay, we're gonna get the creditors and debtors together in the room and we'll have a discussion, we'll agree on the problem and then we can agree on how it's solved. And the debtors came into the room quite, and creditors quite happily. And when they came into the room quite happily, they very quickly agreed that yes, the problem was global imbalances, and yes, China had the surplus, and yes, the US and a couple of others had the deficit. I'm generalizing, but this is basically the truth. Everybody agreed on that. And of course, just as the scarce currency clause was forecast to do under Keynes, uh, the Chinese said the American, it was an American problem, they should solve it. The Americans said it was a Chinese problem, and they should solve it. Everybody agreed on the diagnosis. It was only who should take the action. Uh, that was the difficult issue, and I res respectfully submit that to this day that is still the case. We are not that bad at diagnosing the problem. Maybe we get more symptoms and causes sometimes, maybe that's an issue. But I do think that in terms of who should do what, uh, the issue would still be out there, and I do not know how in a world of sovereign states you really get to resolve that one. Uh, <clears throat> their proposals, it seems to me, to get more authority internationally are fine and good. It's quite clear that that would be, in a sense, one way to solve it. But if I think about something as extreme, and I agree with Barry here, as a world central bank, my question is, if in domestic economies, such as the United States, the United Kingdom, ECB, or whatever, if in those economies we have fights over fiscal and monetary policy and how tight it should be and their criticisms and so on politically, as there are, what on earth would happen if we had countries on either side of that ledger and we had an international central bank and who, to whom would they be accountable in any sense uh, for whatever happened after that? At least I cannot think that through to the point of even imagining it at this stage. Maybe it has to happen, but I don't know how, and I don't know even how you get there on fiscal policy. What I do think is that we have had stages of learning along the way in the 1990s. I think the role of emerging markets was not understood. I think that became, for the major emerging markets, much better understood uh, in, in the past decade or so. I think we still have a lot to go. Obviously, the uh, European difficulties are raising new questions, and some of the paper, some of the discussion here clearly focuses on that. But I think learning will continue, and I have more hope for that for individual countries and getting more sane passengers on the ship than I do for the ship as a whole, uh, sort of somehow agreeing between the sane and the insane how to get there. Thank you. Let me, ask, let me ask the second question now for the poll. You will see it on the screen. So the time that Shani is... So Financial can... safety net is, please choose one option. The alternatives are A, adequate, B, large enough but underutilized, C, too small, D, misspecified and thus incapable of tackling crisis effectively. Please choose your option and push the submit button. Lucky we don't have to do this, right? Ten more seconds. I'm curious. Thank you. Misspecified, 58. OK, that will feed into our discussions after. But uh, OK. Shan Yin, you have the floor. Can we, can we see okay. now the presentation of Shan Yin? Thank you, Peter. Thank you, the organizers of the ECB uh, forum, for inviting me to the uh, panel. I'm going to uh, tilt uh, my uh, initial remarks uh, uh, towards uh, emerging market uh, perspective. I'm going to start with this uh, chart. Uh, you know, uh, there was a time when, uh, when we talk about global uh, growth, you know, focusing on advanced countries uh, will be uh, enough. The, all the leading contributors to global growth are essentially advanced countries by the sheer size of those uh, economies. Since the beginning of this uh, century, uh, China has become the largest single country contributor 
to global growth, uh, surpassing US, surpassing uh, uh, Europe as a group, uh, and uh, so on. And since 2008, uh, India has become the second largest single country contributor to GDP growth. A country's contribution to GDP growth is a product uh, of a country's uh, real growth in uh, real uh, domestic uh, currency times the share of GDP, country economy's uh, GDP in global GDP, the share, uh, uh, using IMF methodology, uh, uses a PPP adjustment. If one does not use a PPP adjustment, then the relative position of India and US would uh, uh, flip. So today, US will still be the second largest contributor, and India will be behind, but uh, China will still be uh, the largest uh, single country contributor. So the world has changed enough uh, that uh, when we talk about, uh, when we want to worry about future global growth, uh, it, it does make sense to keep this in mind uh, and, and think about uh, uh, growth uh, for uh, emerging markets, uh, especially uh, the, the, the leading ones. So, so a closer look uh, at uh, China, uh, People's Republic of China, um, Growth rate uh, uh, is uh, uh, moderating. Uh, there's a tremendous discussion uh, both outside the country and inside country about the uh, underlying causes and therefore uh, the right the policy response uh, to, uh, to this uh, growth moderation. Uh, in my uh, view, the moderation uh, comes from a combination of structural fa factors and transitory factors. And the most imp uh, important structural factors are the following three. Uh, one is uh, a shrinking workforce uh, since uh, uh, 2011, the absolute size of China's uh, workforce, uh, measured by you know, uh, it, it has uh, been uh, shrinking, roughly at the rate of 0.3 uh, uh, percent uh, a year. Uh, so fewer people are working now than before, and even fewer people will be working next year than and this year. And that uh, uh, is uh, a very important structural factor. Uh, a second uh, factor is uh, perhaps uh, better understood. Uh, you know, gazillions of cross-country growth regression uh, supports the idea uh, that uh, as a country's uh, uh, real wage rises, uh, per capita GDP, uh, that growth of per capita GDP uh, should uh, uh, come, uh, come down. You know, in, in, in Asia, where I'm uh, working at the moment, uh, there were a group of countries that used to be called Four Little Dragons. Uh, the, the, the label were meant to be complementary. Uh, it, was a, it was a tribute to a super fast growth rate of those four economies, and they were known as the dragon economies. But today, these economies are four little worms uh, in terms of their growth speed. And that's not particularly surprising because they have reached the level of uh, high, their high income counterparts, and they therefore uh, can expect it to be, uh, grow much faster than high income countries. And they, like, growth rate comes down. China's not quite at their level of income. Uh, yet, somewhere in between, but the uh, same logic applies, and that's the second reason for growth rate to come down. Second is the, this uh, changing uh, growth model that we see, uh, maybe I, I have a, when I'm talking, make sure this slide, that both on the demand side, uh, you see a very rapid increase in consumption as a share of GDP, and, and on the supply side, a very rapid increase in, uh, in the share of service in GDP, uh, with corresponding decline uh, of a share of uh, industry, is going on. Some of those uh, structural transformation, big part of it, of course, is just natural response to rising wages, but, but, but not all of it. Uh, nowadays, if you go to uh, coastal uh, cities, increasingly you're going to meet local leaders. They will say, they will tell you that they, are, they, don't, they no longer welcome any kind, of investment, any kind of investment coming to their cities. They are looking for uh, more you know, low pollution intensive, uh, you know, they don't want to see another chemical uh, factory, they want to see uh, more uh, human capital intensive and, 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 and more environmentally friendly kind of uh, investment. So there's also deliberate uh, uh, policy uh, choices to, to nudge the growth model along. And they understand that uh, could come partly at the expense of uh, GDP uh, growth. So these are uh, structural factors underlying this, especially the first two, I think is perhaps quantitatively most important. There are transitory factors, weak global economy, and and uh, in my view, uh, uh, overvalued, possibly overvalued uh, uh, real exchange rate. And the economy has many, many challenges. But I'm not going to focus on that. I'm, I want to, uh, in my uh, remaining uh, uh, times, I want to uh, talk about uh, uh, three challenges I, I see are especially important for emerging markets. Uh, they have uh, 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 potential implications for a choice of, choice of monetary policies. Uh, aging and PPP deflation 
uh, and uh, uh, pot potential uh, 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 transmission or, or passive transmission of a monetary policy from uh, advanced countries to emerging markets. Uh, aging, um, aging uh, used to be considered a high-income country problem, and no longer, but no longer so uh, today. Uh, with uh, uh, shrinking workforce, uh, you, can, you can get a, a decline in natural rate of uh, uh, interest. In principle, optimal monetary policy uh, should be a bit uh, uh, loser. Uh, in the, with lower natural rate of interest, optimal monetary policy should be a bit loser than otherwise the case. That means that uh, you know, a, a, a standard uh, in quotation mark, a Taylor rule that does not take into account uh, those kind of demographic changes uh, may be too tight uh, relative to the optimal uh, rule. Indeed, uh, this has been uh, invoked as, a, as a, a one possible explanation for the uh, declining, uh, uh, de declining real interest rates in Japan in the last 20 some years uh, in a paper by Fujita and Fujiwara. Uh, and I said, you know, imagine emerging markets are already experiencing uh, aging problem. Uh, China is quantitatively a, a biggest uh, example uh, of uh, that. Uh, uh, the, um, and we, we see the turning point uh, a few years uh, early, depending on which particular age cohort you are seeing. But uh, clearly, the, the working workforce is uh, shrinking. Um, of course, Chinese uh, uh, case is partly driven by uh, the family planning uh, policy, a very strict family planning policy put into place uh, in early 1980s, which for a while temporarily produced a abnormally favorable dependence ratio contributing to China's uh, very fast growth rate. But in the last few years, the situation has flipped. China has entered a phase of uh, abnormally unfavorable demographic uh, force. But China is not alone. In fact, uh, uh, in many uh, other uh, uh, emerging economies, uh, uh, you tend to have similar patterns. So on this uh, graph, I, I tabulated a uh, fraction of people uh, living in different types of demographic uh, features. Um, um, that uh, uh, deep blue is uh, is uh, uh, economies with declining workforce, uh, and uh, red is economy with a stagnant uh, pop, uh, uh, population. And you see that the, the, the sum of these two uh, has increased uh, steadily, and is forecast to uh, increase uh, even more to close to half of the world uh, by 2020. So it's a, a major. Um, uh, feature of the world that uh, we, we, are, we are seeing. Uh, the second uh, challenge uh, is uh, PPI uh, deflation. So normally we don't worry about PPI deflation, or my observation is that we don't worry about PPI inflation separately from CPI inflation. They go together. Both tend to be inflation at the same time, or both tend to be in deflation at the same time. But we are not uh, living in that normal world uh, uh, anymore, uh, and we, not, we tend to see divergence of the two. When the two uh, diverge, there's some reason uh, to think that the monetary policy should, in principle, pay attention to both uh, PPI changes and CPI uh, changes. You know, when you have sticky prices in both sectors, uh, PPI uh, also plays an alloc uh, allocative uh, role. Ignoring uh, uh, PPI uh, could cause, uh, could cause um, monetary policy uh, to be too tight, uh, uh, second reason for monetary policy to deviate from optimal. So here's some chart that illustrates uh, this, uh, this new phenomenon, the PPI, CPI tend to diverge uh, and diverge in many, many uh, uh, countries. Look, looking at uh, uh, PBOC's uh, Vice Governor uh, uh, Zhang Tao here, uh, within PRC, there's a lot of discussion about the fact that the PP, uh, China had had many, many quarters uh, of a, a negative PPI while CPI is still uh, moderately positive. It turns out to be a very, very widespread uh, phenomenon. So I here just listed uh, a few uh, relatively large economies uh, in uh, uh, Asia, where you see in, in majority of those uh, cases, you have small positive uh, CPI inflation. But at the same time, you tend to see uh, negative uh, uh, PPI uh, changes. So PPI deflation has become very, very widespread. Uh, I'm skipping a chart that over time, you see those uh, uh, country economies experiencing PPI have increased uh, quite, a, quite a bit. Now, roughly a third of the economies uh, in the world uh, would have uh, a negative uh, PPI. Um, and the third uh, challenge is 
the first two may be somewhat new, uh, and the last one is uh, not new, but it requires perhaps some new uh, understanding, which is uh, where the uh, emerging market economies uh, suffer from uh, uh, innocent bystanders problem, where monetary policies of the rich world uh, 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 change. Of course, monetary policies of the rich world set according to their own uh, 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 needs, uh, such as the need to deal with Brexit, and surprise bubbles, financial crisis, uh, and uh, uh, so on. Um, the, but the question uh, uh, policymakers of the emerging market uh, strug have to struggle with is, is whether they uh, uh, have to uh, involuntarily import policies uh, which uh, may, may, may or may not be desirable on this. Uh, this is something that's been discussed uh, uh, multiple times. Uh, today, uh, 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 already, uh, there's uh, continue to be uh, uh, people uh, uh, arguing that uh, flexible exchange rate regime has a strong role to play in, uh, in con uh, conveying monetary policy autonomy. But we already uh, heard uh, uh, multiple times there's a discussion about uh, trilemma versus di uh, dilemma, that the idea uh, that uh, uh, found various uh, angles, I cited the, put the three papers there, found uh, various uh, uh, angles there that perhaps a flexible exchange rate uh, isn't uh, uh, good enough. Uh, indeed, uh, in some uh, ongoing work that I do with uh, uh, ADB colleague, uh, that uh, uh, we, let me skip uh, to, to this uh, uh, second to the last slide, uh, that uh, uh, in the data, you know, when we formally look at uh, a country's uh, choice of monetary policy, conditional on what uh, it, it, it should be doing uh, can, uh, based on its domestic uh, uh, need, uh, and control, uh, controlling for global financial shocks, you see whether the country, beyond those two factors, uh, 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 involuntarily imports the monetary policy of an uh, anchor country, in our case, the US. Uh, in that uh, context, we see that uh, uh, my reading of evidence, uh, our reading of evidence, is that the flexible exchange rate regime uh, by itself uh, does not confer enough uh, monetary policy autonomy in the sense that uh, uh, you know, beyond a country's domestic uh, 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 need, uh, we see additional uh, 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 passive change in US uh, periphery country, emerging market country policy uh, following US uh, policy. But there's some interesting asymmetry in there. So uh, there's a spe special reluctance for not following uh, U.S. Uh, policy change uh, when U.S. policy change otherwise will lead to appreciation of the domestic uh, currency. So even if you have flexible exchange regime, uh, data suggests that countries don't uh, feel like they can use it. Uh, in that sense, and the data also suggests that some form of capital controls uh, appear uh, necessary to, to uh, uh, offer uh, some uh, autonomy. Uh, interestingly, we also see some evidence that uh, some combination of a flexible exchange rate regime and capital controls perhaps offer the most, uh, most insulation for emerging market monetary policies, uh, something that we uh, tentatively label as a 2.5 lemma. That is, you see you know, capital controls appears to be necessary. At the same time, there seems to be some additional value of having greater flexibility of nominal uh, exchange rate. <coughs> Let me just uh, uh, summarize that uh, uh, emerging market economy seems to face uh, uh, challenges, uh, some new challenges and some old challenges, uh, uh, including uh, declining workforce and a more widespread uh, producer price deflation, uh, and still have to do uh, with uh, uh, involuntary imports of monetary policy that may not be uh, that uh, great uh, for, for those economies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Many, many points for the discussion. Yeah.